All right, motion of charged particles. The voice in the background that you hear talking about nonsense is Andrew Wongpak. <laughs> All right, if you're hearing this recording and Quatron technology has been proved to be a boondoggle, then a failure. I'm going to start explaining this as soon as the talking stops. I got confused. All right. The electrostatic force causes an acceleration of the charged mass. Now, if you happen to have one charge in the presence of a much more massive charge, that is a charge that has a large mass in kilograms, then the less massive one's going to tend to be accelerating away. I mean, it's an action-reaction force pair, force of one acting on two. But if they're both positive in this case, then maybe one's going to accelerate away. So we would say that acceleration of the moving charge would be equal to Fe over M. And you could say that if there's one really big charge and one little tiny charge, then the little tiny charge is going to accelerate away. I also want you to remember another thing. We've said this before, that electric potential energy, not electric potential, electric potential energy is equal to kq1, q2 over r, and that change in electric potential energy could also be written as electric potential difference, or voltage, times the charge of the object that's moving. And we'll, we can call it Q2. Some people call it Q-test. Q-test is a good name for it. Let's just make a note. Oh, we can do it as lowercase. You're right. I've been doing it as lowercase. I'm not sure that that's standardized. Oh, okay. I'll do it as a lowercase then. Okay. Yep. When an electron is caused to move, or we could say induced to move. Is it possible to make an electron positive? No, that'd be a, a positron. Yeah, we're not going to. We are not talking about those particles. We're talking about electrons right now. When an electron's induced to move by another charge or set of charges, there is conservation of energy. Just like when a mass causes another mass to move. And you could say that the same is true when a proton moves. Now, that's not a positron, but you know what a proton is. It's the, that positive charge with a mass that lays in the center of the nucleus. I mean, these all have masses, but more massive than an electron. So the same can be said about a proton. give people a minute to catch up on the writing.
Well, all we're saying is that if we have a charge, a big massive charge like this one, and another little bitty charge beside it, like a proton and, and maybe a, a large positively charged object, then this little proton, at some later time, may find itself over here, and it's possibly given up some electrical potential energy, and that electrical potential energy may have now been converted into kinetic energy. And conservation of energy should be prevailing here. Yeah, kind of like an E equals E prime situation. So let's put it in those terms, okay? I want to take this guy away. And I'd like to start expressing this idea in E versus E primed notation, okay? So I'm going to say that, well, let's start off that way. E equals E primed for this really massive object with a proton that moves from let's say R1 to a new position, R2. We're going to talk about the energy when it's at its initial position versus the energy when it's at its final position. So R1 is going to be the before scenario and R2 is going to be the after scenario. So in the before scenario, we might talk about its electric potential energy. I'll try and do the subscript in lowercase e just so there's no confusion there. Can I take away the, the old sheet? Okay. Electrical potential energy plus kinetic energy before is equal to electric potential energy after plus kinetic energy after. And the electric potential energy, as we said before, would be equal to KQ1, Q2 over R1 plus... Well, the kinetic energy would just be one half mv squared. Electric potential energy after would be kq1 q2 over r2, and I guess we could say one half mv primed squared. Now, if I get the electric potential energies onto the same side, what I could say is I've got kq1 q2 over R1 minus KQ1 Q2 over R2 equals, and I take the kinetic energies over to the same side, 1 half MV primed, which is really the final velocity squared, minus 1 half MV squared, which is really the initial velocity squared. What you end up getting is, well, on the right-hand side, it's obvious. Final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy, you get delta EK, changing kinetic energy. Right? This is EK minus sorry, EK primed minus EK. On the left hand side, this is EE and this is EE primed. If I had EE primed minus EE, then I could say it's delta E. What about this? What if I just say well, I could, I could multiply the whole thing by negative. And I could say, oh, okay, well, that's really the same thing as saying negative of EE e primed minus EE e is the same as saying just EE e minus EE e primed. Negative of delta EE. E. So now negative of delta EE e is equal to delta EK. Very nice. Negative of the change in the electric potential energy is equal to the change in kinetic energy. So if I can figure out how much the electric potential energy changes, I can figure out how much the kinetic energy changes. Now that's kind of like when we're talking about gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy conservation. The amount that you lose in gravitational potential energy is going to be equal to the amount that you gain in kinetic energy. I mean, this is kind of a, a not familiar scenario, but it's no different than a roller coaster. I mean, this electron's on a roller coaster ride. It's gaining kinetic energy as it loses gravitation, I mean, uh, electric potential energy. 